kind of right, trying to find the trying to find the balance between uh, doing cool research as you all enjoy here and also trying to apply it in real world problems and try to solve them with the specific flavor of models. Sometimes this model don't work, but all right, you have to overcome this. Uh, right, so the the team I am at, the big part in Dorg is called Supply Chain Optimization Technology. And within this organization, there exists a team called IPC, Inventory Planning and Control Simulation. And as the name suggests, the team owns a simulation of the entire Amazon supply chain, uh, the real production supply chain. Uh, every single time you go online and you buy something, then the supply chain system runs to the background to make decisions for billions of events, like uh, for every single product. In, ASIN. We call them ASINs. So when you hear me talking about an ASIN, I mean a distinct product. And uh, yeah, every single time you want to buy something, uh, the system makes so many uh, decisions about where to buy things from, which vendor, how to ship it, how to move it around the supply chain, what's the optimal way to uh, end up to your uh, uh, place. And that's something that uh, it needs to happen in real life. But obviously, most of the components there are a bit uh, too expensive to run for uh, simulation. Like uh, if the component I'm going to talk to you about, which has to do with rebalancing the, uh, the supply chain, so transferring units from one warehouse to another, roughly takes eight seconds for a single product to figure out what's the optimal uh, transfer unit. And we need to plan for around 40 million ASINs and uh, 15 weeks in the future, that's 100 days. That's a lot of eight seconds. And you cannot do that and you cannot do any planning with the real world system. So that's where the applied science in the team come. And our role is to create models. By models, we mean emulators that mimic the behavior of the production systems to plug them into the supply, in, into the simulation in order to be able to, the team to run the simulation in the future and make decisions about it. So my talk is going to be about, as I said, the uh, transfers on the network of uh, Amazon. I'm going to follow a graph, as it says here, and uh, I'll present this methodology, what we did. I'll have a small detour around spherical harmonics and inference on Gaussian processes with spherical harmonics and what's good with them, why we do that. And finally, I'll give some results and we can uh, Keep it interactive. You can uh, ask whatever you want, whenever you want. It works. Right, so here's a picture of how a supply chain looks in practice in, in our world. So on the bottom side, you see uh, two different set of nodes. On the left-hand side are the fulfillment centers, the FCs, which are the warehouses that you know. On the right-hand side, we have the customer locations. And you some warehouses ship directly to customers some don't like the no day up there uh is more of a distribution center we use them in order to uh to, dis to distribute uh, to supply basically inventory to other nodes and some others just directly uh link to the customer so uh in this particular scenario that we look at, imagine that we the three different locations on the customer side, each one of them demand one unit of uh, a mobile phone. And this unit can flow through the system uh, via the red arrows in order to arrive at the uh, customer location. And the, the cost in dollars associated to every age. So how much should Amazon expect to lose by moving this product around? So the interesting scenario is what's happening down on the third location of the customer side. So this, this guy there requires one unit. And there are two ways, direct ways to move it there. The cheapest obviously is uh, the warehouse C. But as you can see, uh, it only has one inventory. If it's visible, it's down on the, uh, the edge of the, on the corner of the node. So it only has one inventory of that unit. And clearly, it needs to ship it to the second location because it's the only active warehouse that can supply that location. So that inventory unit is out of the question in order to ship it to the third customer. So we need to find alternatives, how to best ship it there. And if we look around, we can either ship it directly from B to C to 
sorry, from B to customer three, which costs seven dollars, or we can move ship it from B to C with five dollars transferring, and then from C to three with another fee that, that's eight dollars. So it doesn't work the effort to do that since we have, can do the seven dollar direct, or we can ship it from the distribution center A to C with a transfer that's like cost of three dollars. And then another three dollars to ship it to the customer three. That's six dollar. That's much better. We'll do that. So that's what the transfer component in production tries to figure out. What are the best? Which this is the best solution within all these red arrows in order to redistribute around the inventory at the ABC nodes, so we can have a more balanced situation that we don't get to arrive in this weird scenario that we only have one unit spent. While uh, we cannot afford it because we need to supply to uh, supply more demand, satisfy more demand. So in uh, layman's world, what the transfer system does is it's a giant LP, like linear program, with uh, which all it tries to do is to minimize all possible costs for Amazon while satisfying customer demand. So you need to minimize the cost of shipping from one. Uh, warehouse to the customer, you minimize the cost of missing any sales, like not supplying any demand at the second customer. And you also need to minimize the cost of transferring around the warehouses, your units. And you're doing all that, having in mind that you need to satisfy all the demand or as much as possible. And you also need to respect the laws of, you know, uh, the flow of inventory. You cannot ship more than what you have. And obviously, there must be some sort of upper bound on the number of transfers that you can do, because if you start moving around inventory, there's no reason you just spend money, and there's no reason to move around without any need to do it. So that's what we're trying to do here is I'll try to explain your strategy like a machine learning model that emulates this behavior without trying to solve this giant linear program that requires a second for every single uh, column. So let's see how would someone design an emulator if we go for the fully naive approach. An emulator is just a model. So a model is we need to learn a function. We get some input x, and we need to spit out some output for every single uh, edge on the graph, every single uh, transfer that we need to do. So if you have v outputs arcs, then you need to have a multi-output function that tells you for given the entire snapshot that you have, how many things should you move and where? Uh, if you will look at closer or what would be a feature description for that, it's, as I said, the entire snapshot of the inventory of the networks of Amazon. So you would have to look at every single part, uh, fulfillment center that you have and look at the inventory that they have, the demand they need to satisfy. Uh, obviously, we keep track of the geographical location of the, law of the uh, warehouses because it's technically a proxy for the cost that it occurs to move things from A to B. And we also have like a general descriptor of the actual uh, unit that we move around in terms of uh, how big it is, uh, what's the volume, the weight, which is also a proxy of the cost because it's different cost to move around a fridge than moving around a couple of pens. Right. So if we were naively trying to do something, we'll try to learn a function F, get in the entire snapshot of the system, spit out the numbers. But that cannot be the optimal way because there is some structure in the network that we completely omit. Like It was very clear to me when I first got presented with this problem that there must be some uh, something that we can do in terms of graphs, right? Uh, if you think about it, every single node on the Amazon network must be a node on a graph. And then edges can be... Uh, things like uh, active track routes, like you have a van that gets things from A, moves them to B. So on the left-hand side here, I pose the problem as a classic bipartite graph, where you have your source warehouses and destination warehouses on the right hand. And the, for the particular problem we are looking at, we assume that all destinations are terminal nodes. By terminal, we mean that it's the final load before reaching the customer, so that you don't move around things from that terminal load only to the customer side. So looking on the left graph, uh, as I said, we have source and destination, and red lines denote uh, active track routes that you want to uh, 
to utilize. The problem is that even this is not enough in order to do a nice uh, machine learning approach, because normally when you try to learn a function, these functions operate at the node level. But our pro problem is specified on the arc. So the arcs now are the edges. So I want to know how much should I see from source FC1 to destination FC8. And that needs to, we need to have a further treatment on that in order to bring it up to the, uh, the standards that we want to apply some nice machine learning on the graph. So uh, Masa here uh, had a very good idea and found a nice paper about how you can transform a bipartite graph to a line graph. And in literature, you'll find it either as a line or an edge graph. And all it is is if you go on the original bipartite graph, you take all the edges, and for every single edge, you'll make a node on the line graph. So you have five edges on the left hand side, you'll have five nodes on the right hand side. And one A edge is going to be a one A node, three B edge is going to be a three B node. Now that you have the, edge, the nodes on the line graph, you need to figure out how to connect them. And it's pretty clear how to connect them. You look at whether two nodes on the line graph share the common node on the parent bipartite graph. So one A and one B must be connected because they share the source node one, which means that if you think about it, technically they share the same inventory. It's the same supplier that needs to move things from one to A and from one to B. So they must be connected. And similar, one B and three B must be connected because they share the same destination node, which means that they need to satisfy the same customer demand. So they compete for the inventory of uh, uh, that's coming in. The, the nodes uh, one and three. Now, this is a very nice and elegant uh, structure here because every single node on that graph is exactly the thing that we want, which is the active arc on the Amazon's network. And you can have a function applied on every single one of these nodes. The function as an output will tell you how much you should see. And more importantly, because of all the connections, if a function says, I need to ship something on one B, it's going to be influenced by all the neighbors of 1B, which is pretty cool. That's, that's what you would expect in life. If you want to ship something in 1B, you'll see no, at all competing nodes from the parent one node. And you also try to figure out who else applies to it. So we'll follow the line graph and go further from here. Uh, well, you saw on the title, I have some background on GPs, so I figured out how to do GPs. That's how things work. You, you pick what you know and you go for it. And again, naively, what we want to do is figure out a big function that applies on the entire graph. Uh, you need one function for, for every single node, V, output node arc, and that will get uh, some feature descriptor and you spit out an output for that particular arc. Now, if you think about how should we arrive on that, we'll see it as a building blocks one by one. We would start first by some more local function that acts on every single node independently. This is going to be the G function. Uh, and that G will play some Gaussian forces prime. That's now our GP. And that GP acts on every single one of the nodes that we have on the line graph. And once you have the G applied on all the nodes, you need to find a way to linearly combine them in order to build up the response for the entire graph. And that's happening on the next step with uh, this uh, linear combination by the weights W. We'll see about that uh, in a bit, what W looks like. And since G itself is a Gaussian process and we're just adding up uh, independent uh, Gaussian process, we're gonna end up F being also a Gaussian process itself which uh, will allow us to do some nice inference in the next step. And finally, we we'll just need to figure out what is the input to that G function. As I said, the G applies on the node, the arc node. Uh, that has information from both parent nodes on the bipart graph, so from the source and the destination. So if you think about the entire uh, snapshot of the network where you had information for all the nodes, you'll just zoom in at the relevant uh, node that comprise this graph. These are the relevant warehouses that comprise this node on the graph. So node one and node A. You'll pick the source and the destination features. You can gather them together. 
And then you add your general description about the unit that you should be run. So now that is going to be my description of what the function sees and tries to make the decision. Let's see what. Stephanus, can I ask a question about the previous slide? Yep. So FB is specific to. FB, okay, there are two different Bs here. The one which is very pointy, like a Greek nu. Okay, F nu, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the one after we. So the pointy right. ones are referring to outputs. Right. The curly ones down at the feature level with a superscript. The pointy, the, the curly V is referring at the input node. So it's exactly the same set of nodes that act both as inputs and outputs. So you need to make a decision for every single, if we go back to the graph, you need to make decision for every single one of these nodes as an output. But for every single one of these nodes, you specify the entire graph or the neighbors of it at least. So at the same point, all the nodes act as inputs. So they're indexing the same set, but they are different indices, the curly and the point of view. Mm -hmm. so, so go on, sorry. Yes, uh, the self so F, do you want me to call it F new? Whatever, FB? yeah. Okay, uh, F new uh, has this output um, this desired transfer volume for a node on the micro. And yes. this is the news node. Yes, exactly. So for the, for the news node, as an output node, you go and apply the local function G, which is again different from the same prior for every single function, but it applies on all nodes. So you pick one function, you draw a sample of a function, you go and apply it on every single node, and then you find the W to linearly combine them, and this creates your final output F. But G news and W news are not for different news are not related to each other. For different news that are not related to each other. But for a given new, it's the same function that applies on all nodes. All right. And it's going to be clear in a bit. I'll make some nice connection. So what about W? You can obviously learn W from uh, data, but that's, that's a waste of resources because you haven't explored the actual topology of the graph. So the graph itself has edges. So it tells you what is connected to what. And the best possible thing that you can do is to look at the adjacency matrix A, which tells you which are my neighbors, and then normalize that adjacency by the degree D, which is the sum of the across the rows of that adjacency matrix. And now this W is acting as a local smoother. Every single row on that W sums to one due to the normalization. So in a sense, if you go back here, it will tell you well, I have the response on the entire graph on every single one node, but I'm only going to filter out the ones that are connected to my current output. And I'll do some waiting and I'll combine them together and it'll give me the answer. And that's where I, I need, I want to draw this connection that I said before, like the, the graph structure and the inference that you have to do in the graph is very, very, actually it is a convolution itself. If you think about it, it's just a convolution. Like the way I like to think about it in order to visualize it to other people is that what you do in convolutions, you normally have a big image, right? And that is similar to having a snapshot of your entire network, that Excel. But then you have patches on the image, which is similar to zooming in into uh, different areas of your network where you have your nodes 1A connected to 3B and so on. And then you pick a function G nu, which is local function, pretty much as the weights in your uh, convolution. So you pick a weight and you can evolve it across the entire image. And then you pass it through a nonlinearity or whatever it takes. So this G function is a nonlinear function from a GP and it does exactly the same thing. It's not one-to-one -one equivalent, but they are doing the same thing. They are convolving the entire feature space with that function G. And then finally, you're doing an average pooling. You have your weights W that tell you how to linearly combine all these uh, filters that you have just uh, gotten, gotten out of your convolution. So this WV transpose F is just average pooling. And you have that just by observing graph structure and doing inference there. 
Uh, I can pause here. Yeah, before going to the next step too. If you have any questions, we can go around. What do you think? Or we can move it uh, later on. All right. Well, sure. When we collect the, the path to the light bar, we will lose the directional information. Uh, of the edges, you mean, which is source destination. Uh, technically, no. You can maintain the directional uh, information. You can, there are different ways of computing that line graph. Sometimes people only connect, uh, we'll go back. Sometimes people only have, they keep the direction on uh, the line graph by observing whether uh, the same nodes ending up jumping out and so on. But in this particular case, we're not, we don't care at all about the direction because the node 1A and 1B are all we want to have. Like it's, it's the actual arc, like by arc, I mean the active valid route of a, of a track moving around. So you can think of 1A as one track and 1B as another track. And it doesn't matter the direction because the direction is already encoded in the node 1A. There is only one direction going from 1 to A and another direction going from 1 to B. And I just want to connect these nodes, 1A and 1B, in order to, to affect each other. Uh, does this answer your question? Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay. So what kind of benefit do you get from using a uh, Gaussian process in this problem as opposed to say a graphs convolutional network because it's a very similar architecture? It's, uh, I have actually done this, the same with the graph convolutional uh, CNN. And it's, uh, the benefit is just the same benefit that you get when you compare GPs against neural net. They are better in certain regime of data and especially better when uh, dealing with uncertainty. And uh, we'll see that there is some uh, nasty thing about our data in the next slides that there are severe zero inflation. So you have to struggle very much in order to get some output out of that signal. Uh, in, in any way, whatever I present to you here, you don't need to do it with GPS. You can do it with your favorite uh, NN architecture. All right, uh, so I previously made the connection between GPs and, uh, sorry, convolutions and uh, graphs. And we, I focused explicitly on the function G, the local function G that can be thought about as uh, having your convolution and then uh, ReLU activation. So if we'll think about for a bit what ReLU does is, you have some weights on your uh, CNN, this, let's assume a random, uh, prior on the weight zero mean unit variance. And then you have a linear combination of that weight with your index and you pass it through a rel. Now the relu is just the max of zero comma something and relu is homogeneous to the argument. So we can take, we can normalize these vectors X and W, take their uh, norm out and continuing acting on relu on the normalized features. Now, People in deep learning like to call this layer norm. That's just projecting to a sphere. Like you get your vectors and you project them down to the unit sphere. That's what layer norm is. And then you act, what function now acts on the sphere? And we call these functions spherical functions because they actually can be decomposed in a radial part, which is uh, the, the norm of the vectors, and then the angular part, which is only a function of your, uh, the, the cosine function at this point uh, between your, uh, the angle between your vectors. So that's good. From function, we can build kernels. Now, if we go to the limit of infinity, if we make these nodes infinite wide and try to figure out what's the covariance, so to see what's the equivalent kernel, we take the covariance under W of rel applied on two different features, X and Z. And that's, uh, forget about the exact uh, math there, but that's given out from a nice paper, so and so, uh, about the arcosine, that's the arcosine kernel. And it, uh, it, 
it tells us basically that it's still a spherical kernel, spherical function. Now it has a radial part and an angular part. This angular part is kappa, indexed by t, and that t is nothing but the inner product between your normalized vector x and z. So your kernel now is just a spherical function applied on a the normalized inner product, which is the cosine of the angle. And if you think how you create, sorry. Sorry, that was good. All right. Uh, and if you think of how you construct tips architecture, you get the relo and you compose it with itself. You get the relo, relo, relo. And it's exactly equivalent to, you can get the equivalent kernel of a deep ReLU network by just composing kappa with itself, like kappa, 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 all times you arrive at the L deep kernel of. Uh... Um, sorry, Stefan, there was a question in the chat. Uh, Ilya is asking, this is neural tangent curve, right? Yeah. So this is the, our cosine kernel, but you can extend it to new, the, the inference in order to derive that is a yeah, through neural tangent kernel. Neural tangent kernel is for multi layer, right? Can be defined for multi layer. Yes, so you can find the equivalent kernel of the variant of the network. So, why we care about spherical functions? Because these functions, as I said, is nothing but a function operating on a sphere. And we know that functions that are on the sphere, they have an eigen decomposition where their eigenfunctions are what we call spherical harmonics. And spherical harmonics are these functions phi indexed by L and M. L is the frequency and M is the phase. You can think of them as they actually are the generalization of the standard sine and cosine phases that you know. Like in a circle, you have two phases, sine and cosine, and you can write down a function with as many frequencies as you need with uh, basis of sine and cosine. And in a hyperdimensional spheres, you end up with the spherical harmonics. Now, the nice, there are two nice properties about the spherical harmonics. The first one is they consist of, uh, they, they are an orthogonal, orthogonal basis, which means that the second integral here, all it shows is this uh, orthogonal property of them. So if I get to integrate out the product of two spherical harmonics and I integrate it out around the uniform measure in the sphere, I'll get a uh, delta function, which is only one, if and only if we have matching frequencies and phases. Otherwise, it gets zeros. And the second nice property here is the addition theorem, which is the analog to the addition theorem you have with cosines of different uh, inputs. And it says that for a given frequency L, I can sum out all the phases, product of spherical harmonics summing all the phases. And this gives me a constant, which is L depends, obviously, it's the frequency. A depends on D. And there, there is this polynomial C, which is a Gegenbauer polynomial, but ignore it for the case of this uh, presentation. Uh, all you need to know is that you can either, there are packages out there to, you know, you import sci-fi something, you get your Gegenbauer polynomial, or you can actually also complete analytically by solving an integral. But it's, uh, you can get this uh, answer analytically. Now, why do I mention this? As I said, there are two nice properties. And if we think about it, we said that kernels with relus ending up being spherical kernels. And spherical, ker spherical kernels are spherical functions. They are acting on the sphere. So if there are spherical functions, I can do eigen decomposition with spherical harmonics and have the classic Marshall representation of the kernel. And Using the addition theorem that I just uh, said about, this lambda only depends on, lambda is the eigenvalue, depends obviously on the kernel. For different lambda, for different kernels, you have different spectral properties, so you have different uh, eigenvalues. It doesn't depend on the frequency, on the phase m, so it gets out of the second sum. And the inner sum is the addition theorem we just talked about. So eventually that kernel simplifies to an infinite sum. You can truncate it up to a point that you want of frequencies of some nice uh, 
constant in the sense that can be it's not constant it, it depends it's a constant part that depends on uh the eigenvalue and the frequency and then you have your gecko particle nugget and you can compute that pretty good and easily and fast now the work in the literature has shown that this lambda the eigenvalues decay so as we said they depend on the kernel themselves and they depend on the uh, structure of the space or the dimensionality of how big is our sphere, what dimensional sphere we have. And obviously, they depend on the depth. Like the more you, uh, I'll give an example in a bit. So they decay polynomially as we move to higher frequency components, which makes sense if you think about it. When you want to write down a function as a linear combination of bases, you will start with a constant uh, function, then you'll add a linear, then you add a quadratic third order and so on and so on. So the more you go up in the frequency space, the less of information you'll need unless there's something very crazy that you need to capture there, right? So the decay is polynomial. And it's not crazy to think about it that instead of actually trying and figure out which are the eigenvalues of the kernel, why not we parameterize? Since it uh, decays polynomially with the order of the, uh, fre of the frequency, why instead of specifying a kernel at first hand, then doing spectral decomposition to find the eigenvalues, why shouldn't I just use it somehow for random Fourier representation in higher space, where I can have, instead of lambda L, I can have L, which is the frequency, raised to some power beta, and that beta controls the polynomial decay. And now the great thing about it is that I can learn that beta from the data. Like, what is also great is that, as I said, this decay depends for certain colors like the neural tangent that people from Zoom uh, said. This decay also depends on how mm -hmm. deep your uh, network is. So the decay rate changes, goes slower as you uh, nest these functions. And if you think about the analogy is that thing was happening on a CNN, like in the first layer, you have your image and you may figure out with the first component what is a uh, background like the sky and the grass. And then you have a second layer, you need to have a more high frequency components in order to figure out, you know, here's a dog down on the grass and here's a flying dog up in the sky and go on and go on. So the more you go down in the layers, the more flexible you allow your function to be. So that decay rate must go slower than originally. Right? So this is what's happening now. And you can learn that beta from the data. And to demonstrate that, I'll see you, I'll show you here what I'm talking about. In both plots, they are the same. The one is for a sphere of three dimensional, the other one is for a sphere of 10 dimensions. And we are comparing here the eigenvalue of the, of the NTK kernel, where we found the eigenvalues analytically for different uh, uh, depths. So we go from five to a ridiculous uh, 1,000 depth uh, NDK. And these are all the blue lines that you see, while the orange lines are the parameterized polynomial decay kernel that I just talked about, where I plotted for different values of beta. And you can see for a uh, high beta as beta equals two, the blue line works as close as, has the same similar decay as a five layer NDK. And then for beta is 0.1, you have some sort of interpolation between uh, NDK of layer 10 and NDK of layer 50 and so on. So with the kernel we just talked about, you can figure out from the data, what is a continuous depth of a kernel that you would like to use in order to explain and train as much information out of it. And to me, that was like pretty cool. Uh, you don't need to specify from the beginning what your architecture should be. I can have like this spectral density uh, property of the kernel, and I can try to learn from the data what the spectrum would look like. All right, that was a big detour. Why do we care about it? Go on. Uh, what is the big L is the, uh, is the depth of the your network I use to compute NTK. The big O? Big L, yeah. Big L. The big L is the uh, depth of the 
not the neural network. As I said, you can you can mimic like in the limit the neural network with five layers has an NTK of that five by nesting this couple of functions at the top. Well, yeah, thank you. So that L is the depth. So why is this cool? Because now, if you think about what we do in spherical in Gaussian processes, we need to do inference. And we think about, well, TPs are expensive. I need to infer this crazy matrix, which is M by M or how big it is. And well, with if I use the classical approach with inducing points, you approximate some inputs uh, in the space, and then uh, you have your inducing points U, and you apply uh, the, your GP prior there, and then you can compute your covariance between your function and the U or the fun or the U's themselves, which are the inducing points. And these are just kernel evaluations, but they come with the cause that you need to invert that kernel, which is number of inducing points by number of inducing points log. On the other hand, you can use inducing features instead of inducing points, where you specify that where I live on a sphere, so that's the RKHS that I am on, that function must be on the same space. So my feature U will be the inner product between the function of that RKHS, between the function that I'm looking for and the eigen uh, functions, the spherical harmonics phi. And now I can easily compute the covariances between either the function and the uh, inducing fire, the inducing feature, or the inducing features themselves. So, in the case of the covariance, is just uh, evaluation of the spherical harmonic. But most importantly, the covariance between the inducing features themselves, instead of being this expensive M by M matrix that I have to invert, now it's just diagonal because of the orthogonality property. And that's uh, great news for the GP community, right? You can do pretty nice and fast inference on GPs without losing any information. And you can actually combine all the building blocks together that we talked about with the spherical stuff, with the graph uh, inference, and you can just use the, uh, you can learn that model by optimizing the evidence lower bound, the elbow. And that is nothing but the combination of two terms, which is the expectation under some approximate posterior, which you learn with variational inference. Uh, so the, the expectation under the approximate posterior of the log likelihood minus your KL term, which acts as a regularizer. And I don't need to go through that math unless someone is very interested in. All that matters is that wherever you see a K inverse, you now have a diagonal matrix due to the spherical uh, harmonics. And that's pretty cool. Uh, I can pause here before going through some results for any questions on that dense topic. The spherical harmonics form like an infinite basis? Yes. On the space that you like for every frequency. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see, there is a sum. Right here, you see that there is a double sum. The other sum is a infinite sum because you can have all the frequencies in the world that you can have. And then depending on the topology, like what dimensional sphere you are at and the frequency that you are, you have different phases, different number of phases. And every, every for, for a given frequency, the phases in there are uh, orthogonal. So, when you choose to have some number of uh, inducing features, you just take in like um, equally equally spaced out phases. Uh, no, uh, there is a exact number. So this n of L D tells you exactly how many phases there are on the uh, frequencies, and it's uh, like for three for three dimensional space, you have uh, the constant frequency obviously one. Then you have uh, two, then you have four phases and so on. And if you think about it, the phases are different orientation of the function of the sphere. And there is an exact number of them that you have to compute all of the orientation. So you basically have a rotation like A to the minus J something that rotates the sphere around your function in order to evaluate it. And with the infinite sum, you just care to say, okay, I'm interested in the first 10, as you can see from the decay here, yeah, yeah. you can say, well, there is no point of having 50 eigenvalues because the, the order of magnitude difference between the first one and the 50th is five orders of magnitude, no point of it. 
probably I can uh, truncate it down around uh, I don't know, 15, and that's pretty good. Yep. What is your data does it map from the sphere? Layer not. You so for every data that you have, you have a vector, and as soon as I re remove the norm of it and project it down to the unit space, it now lives in the sphere. Everything is around this one by one high dimensional sphere. Do these then work for like Euclidean data? If I had spatial data, would, would, would that then affect things? Yeah, like the, the Euclidean space is just the uh, uh, d dimensional space where you look at points on Euclidean space. But as soon as I project all these points by normalizing them, as soon as I normalize these vectors, they stay in the Euclidean space, but their topology is a sphere. The sphere lives on the R D, right? With a one dimensional D level, smaller. So now all the vectors, as soon as you normalize them, they are in the Euclidean space, but they live in this uh, intrinsic sphere because uh, of the normalization. So this is in the hidden layers of your neural network where you take the layer norm and then if you consider this as like a deep network, then so what? it's not the layers, it's like the sphere itself is exactly what layer norm does. When you say layer norm, you get a vector and you make all the rows on that vector to have a unit norm. So that's projecting down to a sphere. Yeah. Does that make sense? So if you have you did it make sense. I'm just I'm just wondering. It, we are not saying anything about the, we're not changing the topology. The, if you think about what a sphere is, if you have an RD Euclidean space and you project all your points down by removing the norm of it, you now have le one less dimension to care about. So now everything lives in an SD minus one sphere. If you have an RD dimensional space, you have SD minus one sphere. We're not making any assumptions about, oh, the, there's no manifold involved here, right? Uh, we're still on this Euclidean space and uh, there is a sphere embedded in the RD. I think the idea is that if, uh, if you have a, I'm possibly just paraphrasing, if you have a vector the size of each uh, of T dimensions and you make it of size one, uh, now the last element of that vector, you can determine what it is based on all the other elements because yeah. you know that it's of size one. Yeah. So now it's say minus one dimension, and because it's of size one, it's on a sphere because that's the definition of it. Okay. So everything that has a norm of one must live on a unit sphere, and there the norm since everything if you square it and sum it up together adds up to one, then that's by definition a sphere on a d-dimensional sphere, and. So if you think about two-dimensional plane, you have some big vectors around the plane, but you remove the, the norm of them. Now everything, all vectors will be around this unit circle. This is the equivalent. So the unit circle is the embedded two-sphere on the R2, R, R2 Euclidean space. Well, the R, the one sphere, not the two-sphere, sorry. Do you have any uh, intuition on like what is a high frequency feature? Like, high frequency feature are everything that you know from the classic uh, deep learning literature, right? First of all, uh, in terms of math, high frequency means higher order of polynomials, right? Sure, but like uh, going back to your example, like what in the input? So imagine that in an image, you have a dog. Yeah. The high frequency will be, oh, that's uh, has come greer crazy spots on the fur or it has more fluffy fur and things like that. So in our case, what the high frequency component would be in the supply chain? Pretty good question, I haven't thought about it. Uh, probably something that has to do with uh, intrinsic demand on the node uh, or some uh, something that has to explain also the distance between the, the view. So you have to learn somehow an underlying cost function because you have distances of nodes and then some properties of ASINs. Uh, so that distance function that you need to learn and the underlying cost function must depend on different features. And yeah. by having a projection higher order polynomials, you probably be able to get some weird patterns out of it. 
that's um, in two sentences. That's key mark, maybe. Maybe not. Is the, good image. Is there a reason to um, not want a kernel with as fast as possible, like in the week? Uh, well, want to take L to infinity. Yeah. I guess. L to infinity, no, because probably you'll end up with some weird degenerate kernel. Okay, sure. But uh, it's uh, some sort of compromise, right? You need to figure out what, what kind of function you're trying to learn and how. So, what happens during the phases of learning is normally what you do is that you first try to figure out what's a constant, like where is the mass of the data that you need there. And then you slowly add, trying to add extra features in order to uh, extra, sorry, uh, degrees of freedom that function in order to be able to learn from this data. And by, by nesting these functions, you end up having, giving more importance on the higher frequency uh, components than having a very shallow kernel. So this means that if you have a shallow kernel and you want to approximate a a crazy weekly function, you won't be able to do that because uh, you will need high frequency components. And by the definition of the spectral uh, dimension, uh, decay here, the high frequency component won't be able to do anything because they will decay super fast. But as soon as you start having layers one after the other, you are actually saying that, oh, now my function is going to be much more uh, flexible and more weekly. And now, why it's more flexible because it allows for the high frequency component to have more value, like more weight in this Mercer decomposition. So you need to find a compromise if you're manually fitting them, or you can do this random uh, feature expansion on the sphere and you can learn the spectrum as a hyperparameter. We are almost there. Uh, like a few results, five minutes, and we're done. <laughs> right, that's how real world looks like. Uh, very nasty data, nothing to what you know so far. So on the left hand side, I'm showing you what the training set looks like in terms of a histogram. So I have a train set of, let's say, two weeks worth of data where the output says zero if you don't transfer anything between this arc or the ordinal number of the transfer, like one, two, five, hundred, whatever the number of units. And as I said, it makes perfect sense for having a healthy supply chain to not move around things constantly. This means that the majority of your data is going to be zero. And in this uh, histogram here, something around 96% of the data are zeros. And you occasionally have few uh, transfers around, like one unit there, five units the other way, tops to few hundreds, nothing crazy which makes perfect sense, but it also imposes a huge difficulty in learning a model and trying to learn something from that. And this is where all the building blocks that we combine together, each one of them gives more uh, value in the sense that you first have a graph and now you don't, you first have a multi-output uh, model and now every single row has at least one active unit, one active transfer. So, even if even now the zeros will give you information, it's not just redundancy. You would not you need to know where you should not be transferring. And then you have your graph structure, and then one neighbor suddenly can influence your decision. So you draw extra information from there during training in order to figure out to learn that function. And without getting into any heavy details, the results as a matter of true transfers on the x-axis and uh, predicted transfers on the y-axis are shown on the right plot here. And every cross on that plot is a single arc, so a single node in the network. And we have roughly around 200 arcs on that node, so different uh, routes. And obviously, the closer you are to that uh, diagonal line, the better your prediction is. If you are above the diagonal line, you ship more, you transfer more than you should. If you are below the diagonal line, you transfer less than you should. And the error is very asymmetric because in the supply chain world, people use what is called absolute percentage error, which on the numerator, you have the absolute error between true and uh, uh, predicted, and you divide by the actual, uh, uh, the true volume. So 
if you sip less, the, the less that you can sip is zero. So if you're on the bottom right hand of the of the plot, you will have hundred at at, at, mark, at most hundred percent error. But on the upper left hand side of the plot, you can be infinite. Like you can sip ten times more. This means that you have thousand uh, percent error. So we do care a lot on what's happening with this kind of predictions here. Why this happens. And if we see the same plot, forget about it for this. It's the same exact plot, but now I have ordered all the bars according to the volume. Now, every single bar here is one of the crosses that we looked before. And now the, the height of the bar is the actual MAPE, the absolute percentage error I talked. Uh, so instead of having this to the scatter plot, we now see what is the error uh, per volume on this exact its arc. And by looking at it, there are two distinctive things. The good thing first is that the model does very, very good in the very high volume marks. Like wherever you have high volume you have, on the left-hand side, you have low errors in, on ours. And the majority of the error of the model accumulates on this side of the, of the graph where you have the lowest volume marks. Now, the bad thing is, <laughs> this kind of thing here, right? This is, you go up down to the y-axis, that's like five, which means like five times, you see five times more than you should have. When I saw that first, I was like, probably the model has gone crazy there and it's just firing up uh, or has some weird variance and hasn't managed to learn anything from the data. So this means that if you had to, if the ground truth says SIP one, you SIP five, as an example. So I went, deep down in order to deep dive what's happening there. And on this slide here, uh, let's focus only on the top row. We zoom in in this worst performing arc. And on the left-hand side, we see what is the actual true data for the span of one week or the test week. And on the right-hand side, we see samples of the model that we learned. Now, that makes perfect sense. Let me explain. Uh, this is one week worth of data, and the first week, the first day, is a Sunday. So the first day, you have some nice active volume of a few thousands of uh, transfers, and every single day after that is zero. This means that that dark is technically shut down during your testing period. And if you know a bit more of how the simulation works, our simulation runs every single Saturday, every single Sunday, sorry. And it predicts from all the days in the future. Now, once it runs on Sunday, it has seen the simulation knows everything about which is the active arc set, so which are the valid arc routes, and it acts accordingly. So on till Sunday, there were some active arc that was going from HIL3 to SIL2. That was a valid route. But from Monday onwards, that wasn't anymore a valid route. This can happen in a young network like the one that we are exploring because. Nodes appear and disappear as you progress. And maybe a new node came up, and now that arc is not feasible anymore because there is another supplier that can ship to SIL2. So we were completely unlucky here because during the test time, the, the arc wasn't active <laughs> for the majority of the time. And you can see that the model has learned something very reasonable, like with a nice, uh, uncertainty, the samples uh, look similar to each other. They have some selection along the week. So it has done a pretty good job. And it's roughly around the same magnitude of the transfers that it has seen in the past. They are just one hour away from each other. They're what? They are just a one hour drive away from each other, those two, if you trust me. Are they? Uh -huh. I wonder if that's, like, that's way too close, I think. Maybe, so maybe they said that, screw this, we don't, we don't need it. We can, we can drive them by feet. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but that's not that a big problem in a product because as I said, the emulation, it's a model and the parent, the parent class is the simulator and the simulator calls the model in order to make a prediction. And every single time during this uh, horizon of 105 days, the simulator knows every single day what is the active set of routes that you are allowed to do. So even if the model gives some crappy answer like that, 
which is not crappy in the sense of the model output, but it's not feasible anymore. You can filter it out during simulation by just running your output of the model against the valid active set. So you can just ignore that. And this is what actually we're doing in practice. So that was all I had to say. Sorry for going a bit longer. But hopefully you heard something interesting today about how you can do cool stuff, hopefully, while addressing a problem. And there are some nice work in the end from uh, other people that I followed around and the lots of the work that I saw here are just uh, building on top of this uh, papers. Uh, good reads, I suggest you go for them. Let me know if you have any further questions. And yeah, cheers. I would suggest that for further questions, they should be catering uh, over in the, that area. So you could ask Stefano's questions over there. That's All it. Right. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Thanks again. <laughs>